You looking at me? Are you looking at me? Welcome, mere mortals. Apart from the threatening to another episode of the book reviews. Today, I have the book for you, John Ronson's The Psychopath Test. Now, I decided to read this book after reading So You've Been Publicly Shamed, which I really enjoyed the style of it. And uh, this book was published just before that in 2011. The publicly shaming book was in 2015. And yeah, I just, I guess I would say his style was something different that I hadn't particularly read before. And so I was like, you know what, I'm going to dive into it a little bit more. So I grabbed another one of his books. He's got many, but this one just appeared um, in my radar. Now, this book is a bit of a delve into the world of psychopathy. And he looks at it, I guess, from both sides, that being the side of, I guess, the patients, and then also from the side of the the people judging or the doctors, the the people in positions of power who are saying, yes, this is what a psychopath is and whatnot. It briefly touches, um, like his other book, he goes through a very rapid style, each chapter sort of being a separate story in itself. And he touches upon many different people. I'm just going to name a few here so you can get a feel for it. One is Bob Hare, the guy who invented the psychopath test. Another is Tony from Broadmoor, which is in England, I believe, a very, um, I think, like maximum, maximum security mental health facility. And it's the story of a guy who faked being insane to get out of a prison sentence, but ended up getting trapped in this hospital where it seemed like it was impossible for him to prove that he was actually sane. There was Toto Constantine, who was a Guatemalan leader of a a, a death squad, I believe, uh, in a political sense, who committed some absolutely horrendous crimes and was locked up in a US prison. There's Al Dunlap, who is... I guess a psychopath in in one sense, but he was also a successful psychopath in that he was the leader of of big companies and he was one of those people who would get called in to make dramatic job cuts and reduce workforces. And he had a sort of ability to fire people and excitement in in firing people. Uh, David Shaler, who is a somewhat conspiracy theorist type person who went down that route and ended up you know, I guess you could say psychopathic, but also was in the crazy realm. And I'm going to touch on that in a, in a couple of minutes. So the th- main themes of the book. So for me, the number one is obviously how do you define a psychopath? Now in the book, we, we pretty much have the gold standard being the, the checklist um, proposed by Bob Hare, which is about 40 questions. And it, it touches upon things like, does this person feel empathy how do they relate with other people um, in certain situations? What do they display? Do they display a, uh, I guess, like a zealous feeling? Do they um, care too much about themselves? And it's it's very, very subjective, very subjective test. It, it's, I mean, it, it has the appearance of being quantitative because it has 40 items, but from what you could see in it there, it, it did seem a quite a little bit vague and, it's just intriguing, I guess. Are there better tests out there? Are there less subjective methods, perhaps involving brain chemistry with looking at brain scans and whatnot, which we could use to determine, okay, this person perhaps is uh, psychopathic or they have a, a tendency to not think clearly about their actions and how these actions are going to relate to other people and do they even care if this actually hurts other people? Do they have that empathic uh, ability to, to feel compassion and, and empathy. Now, in the book, he says there's about a prevalence of 1% of psychopaths in, in everyday life, but these can get concentrated in certain areas. So apparently, and this is, uh, yeah, once again, I'm not, not too sure of the science here, but apparently the in CEO type positions, you will draw in a larger percentage of people with psychopathic tendencies. Uh, also, you would find in in prisons, obviously, there tends to be a more a higher percentage, going up to twenty five percent. And once again, these numbers, I wouldn't put too much emphasis on the numbers, and I'll, I'll speak with that as well in a little bit. But it, it's interesting just to know that there are attempts out there to quantify what is a psychopath and how can we deal with them in in everyday life, because the destruction and mayhem that they can cause is definitely amplified in in i guess comparison to what a normal 
person would be able to do. The other theme that I think really touched upon in, in the book was over diagnosis and slippery slopes. So there was way too many stories of how the adjudicators, so this in the sense it would be the medical professionals and judges and people in positions of power had a bit of, I guess, something wrong either with themselves or the thought processes or the mental biases that were going into it. So this can be either very overtly. So there's a couple of stories in there of how when they were first trying out, I guess, experimenting with what is psychopathy and how do you measure it and how can it be reformed? There was a, a couple of hospitals where this was back in the you know crazy 60s, 70s, 80s where uh, a lot more would fly and they were giving LSD to their um, to the psychopaths in in their care, the people who had committed very violent, very horrible crimes. And they were trying to reform them with group sessions, with putting criminals with other criminals and mingling between the staff and the criminals, having like big love sessions of... of I, I wouldn't go to the extent of saying that they were having orgies, but they were definitely having the sort of free love, hand-holding, you know, music in the air type of type of deal so in in those cases it was it was proven pretty pretty quickly that okay you have no idea what the hell you're doing and you're just doing random shit here uh, but in the other cases uh, this also can be a lightly sort of thing so as john ronson was was writing the book and having these experiences talking with these people he himself was noticing that in his everyday life he was trying to use the checklist to say oh yeah this person, um, lack of empathy, uh, number 26. And so he was trying to become like an amateur sleuth in a sense of picking out psychopaths. And when he was doing this, he just found that psychopaths were everywhere. Essentially, that seemed to be what he was indicating. So yeah, that does seem to be a, a bit of a slippery slope. And it, uh, it, it did show the biases that was in a lot of the system. And the, obviously the perfect example of this was Tony from Broadmoor, which it, it was hard to determine what this guy was about. There was definitely something off about them, uh, about him as a person. I think that is pretty clear, but it, it seemed he'd, he'd got trapped in this system where he pretended he was insane and then he went to an insane asylum and then there was no way to prove that he wasn't insane. And this has happened in multiple cases before. Um, a very famous example, I can't remember the, the name off the top of my head, where a, a doctor would send in his uh, sort of grad students into a bunch of, get them admitted into um, hospitals, mental hospitals, and were saying, you know, I uh, don't tell them about it. You, you pretend you're insane to get in there and then you have to do everything you can to prove that you're sane to get out. And, um, they just wouldn't let them out because they would then say the fact that you are pretending to be sane proves that you're insane. That's sort of mental processing going down rabbit holes like that. So I found that quite intriguing. And and then, of course, vice versa, when he they were saying, oh, uh, the people like the adjudicators of these mental hospitals were then saying, oh, yeah, but you were tricking like that's not fair. He, he said, okay, I'm going to send a bunch more students. And then they were saying, yep, we found all of them. There was 42 fakes trying to get in but he hadn't sent any. So it does seem just a very, very strange system and very hard to pick out who is actually crazy or insane or psychopathic and can they be reformed? Can there, there be people who are accidentally let in and then they had to change their mind or vice versa? Are there people out here who can you go in between states of psychopathy and not? Yeah, it's, it's very hard. The other one was uh, of this overdiagnosis and slippery slopes was the continual addition to the DSM. So the DSM is the Diagnostic and Statistic Manual of Mental Disorders. And this is used in the United States. I'm not so sure about here in Australia. But this manual was uh, the first volume of it was very short, had maybe like 80 men mental disorders. And then the second volume had maybe 130 then the next one had 190 and then it just kept on growing and growing until this list of mental disorders, basically anyone anywhere has a lot of them. <laughs> so it, it, once again, this just gets to the point of being how subjective, how, well, how objective actually are these, these things that the we're using to determine whether someone 
should go to jail or not can be free to be let out in society do they need to be on drugs or mental help or therapy or whatever it is i read a book uh, called adhd nation a couple of years ago which talked about how adhd was once a a very rare sort of diagnosis maybe one i think it was saying in the one to five percent range and then just over time it had gotten so so big that 15 percent of kids were now being diagnosed with adhd so a threefold increase over a time span that would not justify that so that was just seemed to be indicating how society has more of a role than actual you know objective facts i guess can also get into the role of pharmaceutical companies and um, bad incentives, but I'm just going to leave that for another day because I could I could go down a rabbit hole with that. So a couple of my own observations: uh, if it's one in a hundred people that that are psychopaths out there, then we must meet them on a daily basis. Obviously, if a lot of them are being locked up, maybe it's let, let's just reduce that to say one in a thousand. But I would not feel comfortable calling one in a thousand people that but i guess it's because i don't know a thousand people really deeply and intimately so that's i don't know I, that that seems like a a very high number for me but it could just be i'm not interacting deeply with those people or i notice someone is psychopathic and i get turned off by them or i'm the actual psychopath who knows <laughs> could be could be and it, it does seem to be one of those things that much like, uh, do you think you're a better than average car driver? 90% of people would say they're better than the average. It could be the same thing with psychopaths. Too many people are saying they're not psychopaths, but there actually is a certain percentage of, of people. Yeah, there has to be, who knows. It seems to also be a very hazy line between what is crazy and why, what is psychopathic. So he pretty much in this book just stuck to what is a psychopath and going down that list of yeah you you have these certain qualities you're you don't feel empathy you uh, don't care about other people you take certain actions you're very transactional in nature when it can't it comes to emotions and and uh, you know you're not disgusted by the sights of dead bodies or anything it more just intrigues you and so uh, the book doesn't go too deeply into the actual brain chemistry and the you know sort of what areas of the brain get triggered in different parts and which is I think uh, that scientific method is a lot more useful when saying who is psychopathic and who is not. So uh, yeah, in in summary, I guess uh, John Ronson he weaves a beautiful narrative. There's no doubt about it, and his books are just plain fun. You you cannot read his book and not just get some enjoyment from his style of writing from how he talks about things it, it's it is plain fun and he's very good at raising questions but doesn't spend a lot of time answering those same questions so you might come out with a book with all these things in your head going around but he doesn't particularly solve them he just raises the question and, and that's fine that's his style uh, so i would say this book is not for a person who likes the deep dive into something who likes the nuanced views or whatnot um, this is very subjective it's his uh, opinions. I already talked in in the in the last book review of 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 his about how he is a Gonzo journalist, so he involves himself in the stories as well. So it's it's just fun. So I'm giving it a seven out of ten, and I think that would be probably pretty similar for most of his books. In that his his style lends itself to it's not going to be a classic. It's not going to be a book that will be read in a thousand years time, but. It is a book that is fun and it probably won't go below a, a, you know, a 6 out of 10 because his books are just so engaging and he has a very fun way of, of relating things. Something pragmatic I'm going to take from, from this book. I'm just going to be a little bit more careful with my use of the word uh, psych, psychopathic, calling someone a psychopath. It does seem, now that I've read this book, it does seem like one of those words where you just have to be very careful and it could mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. So I'm just going to be careful when I use it and only use it for <laughs> situations where I feel it's really called for. So that was my opinion of The Psychopath Test by John Ronson. I hope you enjoyed. If you believe you're a psychopath, if you think I'm a psychopath, if you are intrigued by the questions of psychopaths, I think this is a great book to read and uh, to dive into, I guess, not dive into, but skim the surface of, of these questions. So that's it for today. Hope you enjoyed. Karen out.